without further ado, the message I want to share is called Hit the Gym of Godliness. Now, I, I honestly think it could be titled more like the essence of the Christian life, given how important it is, but I'm going off of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, which says, Exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That's a pretty strong verse. How many you know, of us are... We get pretty obsessed with the physical exercise, hitting the gym, researching different supplements, creatine, protein powders. Everybody's kind of worried, creating new, you know, New Year's resolutions of physical exercise, which is great, staying healthy. But Paul here is saying godliness is on another level. The amount of effort we put towards that physical exercise and culture as a whole, imagine if that was redirected towards godliness. Imagine if the amount of time and energy and finances spent on trying to develop some perfect body or be physically fit for whatever reason was dedicated to this faithful and worthy saying of godliness. When we look at the Greek word for exercise, it's actually to train naked. No, no joke. The word gumnos means naked. And in the Greco-Roman culture, athletes would train naked. But really, it's actually just to train and to undergo discipline. But um, the, the exercise, that is training, that is discipline, that requires work, that requires effort. And the concept of really the Christian life being a, a game or a contest is seen th- all throughout Scripture. It's something that we learn to do and we, we dedicate ourselves to doing it well. Take a look at Hebrews, which says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Or Paul in Corinthians, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. This is the race. This is the contest. This is what we're meant to be dedicated towards, to grow in. A man by the name of Clement of Rome, who was actually the third bishop of Rome, ordained by Peter the apostle, and who knew the apostles, he writes, let us have faith, brothers and sisters. We are competing in the contest of a living God and are being trained by the present life in order that we may be crowned in the life to come. Having this mindset, just imagine this guy, third bishop of Rome, if you were found out to be a Christian, you're getting murdered, you're getting executed right then and there. People, spies were infiltrating their gatherings and trying to arrest people all the time. They were having to baptize down in the catacombs because if you go out into the river, they're getting executed. They're getting thrown into the, the games. The Christian people at this time, their path of godliness, them seeking godliness was life or death. They were willing to give up everything to be formed into the image of Christ, to grow in their godliness And having this idea of a contest really allows one to see how important it is to to really grow in it, to get better at it, to win at that game. And this was instrumental in them only 300-ish years later, actually conquering the greatest civilization on earth, which was Rome, the biggest in the world. Christianity defeated that civilization. We read 1 Timothy, which emphasizes just how important godliness is. It says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. May we all understand this teaching. May we all grow in our revelation of godliness and how important it is. So what is godliness? Well, in English, godliness is godlikeness, becoming like God. 
Now, not in the sense of becoming God or becoming aware that we are God, as, as many Eastern religious perspectives have, that, that we are simply God seeking to, to remember that we're God or we can become God. No, becoming like God in the sense of our character, our morality, sharing in his, his divine goodness and becoming more like him as, as a person being formed into the image of Christ. After all, we were created in the image of God. And sharing his likeness, becoming godly, more like him, is the true path of the Christian. The Greek word for godliness, eusebia, is defined as to live as God would have us live. Or to live as God told us we should live. When we think about godliness or holiness and purity, it's really just morality. You know, the, the essence of the Christian life is morality. And many religions around the world are seeking to become better people. You know, Buddhism, you know, espouses to, to seek after compassion. I was very, very involved in Buddhism in my early years, uh, uh, my spiritual journey. And it's a noble pursuit to have compassion for all living things, to meditate, to, to meditate for all humankind, to have compassion for all living things. But the fullness of compassion is in Christ. The fullness of love is in Jesus. The fullness of righteousness and the true moral path for the soul is found in the example of the man, Jesus Christ. I remember when I was in my spiritual journey, I was in college and I was walking to class and I was philosophizing about, you know, is the meaning of right, life really just to, to be happy? Because, you know, you'll ask many people, they say, what, what's the meaning of life for you? Well, it's to be happy, to live a good life. You know, what do you want for your kids? Well, I want them to be happy. Well, that's not a bad thing to, to enjoy this life, but if it comes at the cost of ethics, it's not the ultimate pursuit. And I remember my mind, just like this thought over and over hit my mind as I was going into the building. It was a very distinct day, a turning point kind of in how I saw the world. It was like, I just heard ethics is everything. Ethics is everything. Not just living a happy, good life, but truly being an ethical person. And only a year or two later, I come to give my life to Christ and the gospel is preached to me and I understand the word of God. But my soul was seeking for what is the true path of morality. Where is it? Who is it? Well, what's to follow? What's the example to become more like? And I'm telling you, it's Jesus Christ. He is the one to follow. So how do we become more godly? I want to share a couple kind of practical principles and aspects of godliness that we see throughout the Bible, even throughout how the Jews lived, the, the culture that God created amongst his people. But we first must understand that it's grace that empowers us to be godly. Second Peter chapter one says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. You see, through the knowledge of him, and that brings me to my first aspect I wanna share, which is connection. The three are connection, reflection, and confession. The first as connection is really to be more like God, you, you first got to know what God's like. And to do that, it's really simple. We all know this, prayer and reading the word. If you want to start taking your walk of godliness seriously, you need to first connect to God to know what godliness is. And through prayer, by getting into his presence, by seeking his face, by shutting off the things of this world, of this life, the influences of really getting into that secret place and communing with God, conversing with him, you can experience him as he truly is in a lifetime moment. You don't need to just study and study and study and think you know about God. Prayer is when you truly experience him as he is. And in that moment, when you're in his presence, when you're in his light, when you get to taste of his goodness, automatically, the Bible says, the goodness of God leads one to repentance. Automatically, you begin to realize, man, you know, 
I exaggerate all the time, or I, there's still lust in my heart, because you, you see the holiness of God, and you're in such awe, and you're in such wonder, and all you desire to do is be more like him, because that gives him the most glory, following him. He says, those who love me obey my commands. To truly love God is to obey him, to be like him. Just think of your kid, you know, fathers. If your son wants to be just like you, how, how good does that feel? You know, when he wants to do everything that you do, be just like you. Just imagine your heavenly father and how he wants us to be and how much joy that gives him when we genuinely care on a regular daily basis that we are acting and being like him. Um, John Wesley, he said that prayer is the grand means of drawing near to God. Prayer is vital. Prayer is is vital for us to truly know God because we experience him as we're meant to. Just think about Adam in the garden. There was no scripture. There was nothing to study or read. It was a daily living with God. Or Enoch who walked with God and was taken up. He didn't even die. It was a daily intimacy with God, their creator, the one who knows them more than anyone else. And that can be done in prayer. Next is reading the word. These are simple, but these are powerful. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. When you read the word, sanctification is happening. When you read the word, his truth is sanctifying you in that moment. Reading his word not only allows us to know what he's like, which when we're in prayer and you get kind of an interesting thought, knowing the word, knowing the character of God, you can discern, was that truly God or is that the enemy trying to kind of get into my relationship with God here, steer me astray? So the word gives those, those uh, uh, boundaries by which you can truly know that who you're communing with is God because you come to know more about him. When we look at the Old Testament, the Jews had the law or the word placed front and center in their lives. Literally, on every doorpost of their home was what's called a mezuzah, which contained a scroll of scripture. And it was a specific scroll of scripture known as the Shema, which was one of the most prayed and used scriptures in all of ancient Israel. And this, you know, even Orthodox, many devout Jews today have the box on their forehead. Well, that was actually a very common practice in, in Jesus's time of devout Jews. The box contains scripture on their forehead, symbolically representing that the word of God is so close to their minds and hearts at all times. Twice a day, the Jews would pray the Shema, which is this portion of scripture I'm going to read to you, morning and evening during the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice on a continual basis with their household. And what, what this scripture says is it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The Jews did that literally. How much more are we meant to have the word in our daily life? God's word daily. You know, we've got phones. Immediately, you could pull out the Bible app. You could either do a verse of the day, a chapter of a, a, a day. You could do so much more with just five minutes given to God. Literally just five minutes every morning and evening will change your life, will grow you in your walk, in your pursuit of godliness, which God cares so much about, which is the essence of following Christ, because you're sanctifying yourself in that moment by his truth, by his word incorporate this, take this seriously, not in some legalistic way where you have to, to be saved or no, this is just to give pleasure to God, give glory to God by growing and being formed into his image in a greater and greater way, day by day. The next aspect, which is reflection. In the Old Testament, throughout the Bible, the Jews had a, had a practice of continually on a regular basis reflecting on their moral conduct, on their moral behavior. For example, twice a day, they would pray during the evening, during the morning and the evening sacrifice. They would pray the Shema amidst others. And there was this knowledge that 
God is so holy. I want to be like him, but sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I fall short in these areas, but I want to be like him. And this prayer was, was to be more like them, to, to, to confess their sins because the, in the morning and the evening sacrifice was a continual burnt offering to the Lord as atonement for the sins of the nation. And on a daily basis, this understanding was in everybody's minds that we are not God. We want to be like him and please him And so we live as holy as we can to be clean, but we are not like him. And they would reflect on what can they improve? Where can they uh, uh, grow in their holiness? And even annually on the Yom Kippur, which was the most solemn and holy holiday of of Jewish uh, culture, everybody in the nation would repent and confess their sins to God. To repent and confess means they had to reflect, what did I do this year? What did I do this week? What did I do that was not in honoring of God? How did I treat my family? I lash out at my kids. How did I treat my wife? Did I honor my mother and my father? There was a reflection period on an annual basis, which is extremely serious, more than just the daily basis, and a confession to be cleansed through the sacrifice in the Old Testament system, even in the early church on a weekly basis. Paul said that before partaking of the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion, one should examine themselves. Examining themselves. And in the early church writings, we see that they would take Holy Communion on a weekly basis and there was confession that would occur prior. They took it very seriously that if any sin was in their heart, if they did anything wrong, that before partaking of the Lord's blood and body, that they would confess their sins, that they would examine themselves on a weekly basis. How much are we examining ourselves on a weekly basis, in an intentional way, really reflecting how were we at work? How did we treat people? Was I mean to this person? Did did I exaggerate? Was I lying when I said this? How did I treat my wife, my husband, my kids? Are we on a weekly or even daily or just a regular basis reflecting and then confessing to God? This is the process of sanctification that we see all throughout God's relationship with his people and still to this day in the teaching of godliness. Confession, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession brings a cleansing of unrighteousness. Confession brings a sanctification, becoming more like God. The Jews, when they would sin, there were, there were different types of sins. You know, unintentionally, if someone sinned, they brought a sin offering. If they intentionally sinned, they'd have to bring a guilt offering. And they would bring these offerings to the priest. And it was depending on their level of income, what type of sacrifice. They give it to the priest. The priest would perform a sacrifice place the blood on the altar to atone for their sins so they would be cleansed. And even in the case of if they did an intentional sin and harmed another person, there was actually a restitution that would be required. Because sometimes we sin, we hurt another person, or we do something wrong, or we steal. It's not, it's not just confessing to God that is the right thing to do, but it's also to bring restitution to give that back, to to say I'm sorry to the individual, not just confess to God, you always a jerk to that person, hey, Lord, forgive me. That's a good, that's a first step, but also go make restitution. And even as I'm saying this, you know, we all have small or even large things in our lives that the Lord wants to be cleansed out of us, to be confessed, to be released, to be out of our lives, darkness that's in our heart, and it's usually from sin. Moral failings can corrupt the heart. And when you confess them, the Bible says, confess your trespasses, your sins to one another that you may be healed. There's healing that occurs in confession. This is why when we have prayer line, we spend hours beforehand talking to people as they would confess, as they confess their sins. And there's so much healing that occurs there before they're even here at the altar. Through confession, the devil is conquered. Through confession, darkness comes out of us and is gone and eradicated by the light of Christ. His light just evaporates any works of darkness. But it requires our will to be engaged, to to reflect, to know, to repent, to confess and release it. This is the process of becoming more like God. 
more godly, more holy, more pure in our hearts. And we're meant to take this more seriously than almost anything else in life. This is the true mission that our soul has here on earth before we're with the Father in heaven for for eternity. We have one chance to give it everything we got, to please him, to be more holy, to be more sanctified, and follow Jesus truly in our actions, not just our words. It's great to be free. God brings us freedom and healing and brings us joy that's, uh, you know, insurmountable. But he also asks us to be more like him morally. That is more important than the, than the freedom or the healing. Because many people, they sacrifice physical healing or physical comfort for moral decisions in alignment with God. That's the first hundreds and hundreds of years of the Christian faith. To confess Christ meant death, meant poverty, meant you'd lose, you'd go to prison, you'd lose everything. That was following Christ because we have the hope of eternity. We know that this lifetime is really just a short, a vapor that vanishes away, the Bible says. And when we think that this life is everything we have, this is all we got, we just need to to live it up as best as we can because there's nothing else, you're wrong. Right when we die, we actually enter into the true life, which is eternal life with Christ. And having this mindset, fixating our eyes on the things above, not the things below or of this world, allows us to know the importance of godliness, of our soul, which lives forever. That's what we need to be investing in. Not just hitting the gym and hitting the weights and looking good and, you know, uh, and all those things, which are great, but hitting the gym of godliness. And the, the, the number one thing we can do to be godly, which God mentions, you look in the Shema, it's love. Love for God, and as a result, love for our neighbor. Isn't that what Jesus said? The first and greatest commandment, love your God and then love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus himself said this is the most important thing. To love God, Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. It's not just weeping in tears in prayer and not changing your lifestyle. He who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Those tears of repentance should bring change of action because that's truly saying, God, I love you so much. I want to be just like you. I want to please you. I want to do your will. I don't want to live with these parts of my soul and my heart and things that I was maybe as a kid or a teenager or I am right now, things that I've been for 50 years, I don't need to be today because the Lord can change you in an instant if you just ask him, cleanse me, make me pure, make me holy, sanctify me. That's his core desire for your life because there's a joy that's unimaginable that comes through this process of sanctification, of becoming more like God. There's a joy that nothing can touch. And that joy, as the Bible says, it was the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. A joy of, of God's nature, of us of us communing with him. Everything that he was looking for was eternal. And when we have that joy, nothing's gonna be too much for us. We'll never sacrifice. We'll never, you know, get corrupted by our employer or our job to try and maybe earn a better salary at a sketchy company doing sketchy things. No, we'll have a moral compass. And we, we, don't, even, we don't even calculate what it would mean to lie and, you know, steal or take advantage of that person. It's not even imaginable. And there's such a stronger joy that comes from that instead of teeter-tottering on all these things. But it only comes from really knowing who God is and then knowing, I want to be like him. I don't want to do that. Peter said, giving all diligence, add faith to Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness. But this isn't the final thing. To godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. The ultimate virtue. Paul said, abide in faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Love God. Make that your core aim in life, to love God. 
more than any other goal, New Year's resolution, more than any other thing that you want to achieve in this, in this lifetime that maybe even God gave you as a vision and a mission for your life. Just love God. Seek the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life at all times. Allow this love for God to fuel everything you do because when you love him, he's gonna guide you. He said he'll manifest himself to you. You want to know God? You want to have encounters with God? Love God. Love Him. And all that will come. And the most important thing, the most beautiful thing really is godliness and growing in this. Just think about people who maybe have come up from a Christian upbringing and they were told everything about God, told everything that they should believe, must believe, and hey, maybe it's even the truth. They got it all right. But their parents were hypocritical. Their parents maybe weren't even walking in the things they were saying, weren't even living for God, weren't even godly people. How many of those people have now left the faith, rejected Christ, rejected God? The best witness you can do is to grow in godliness. To actually show people, demonstrate people who Christ is instead of only tell them about who he is. Godliness is truly, as Paul said, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That when people saw Paul, they were seeing Jesus through his actions, through his conduct, through his love for people, for souls. That is what we're meant to grow and to surrender, to die to our own identity, to die to ourself and allow Christ, allow the Holy Spirit to just flow through us uninhibited, impacting everyone in our lives, impacting everyone that we ever come in contact with. Just the Holy Spirit, have your way. That's godliness. That's true surrender taking up your cross daily. That's the essence of the Christian life, to bring the light. Who's the light? It's God. To bring the light into this world of darkness. How much does this world need light? It's not us who brings light. It's not even us who really, anything good comes from God, the Bible says. When we do good works and we do good things, we're just allowing God to use us. And that's what we're meant to do as the beacon of light, as the church, to grow in that. That is the core mission of our soul in this lifetime. Ignatius of Antioch, he's another early bishop, third bishop of Antioch. Antioch was actually the first city where followers of Jesus were called Christians. And it was in a derogatory way. He likely knew the apostles as well. This is what he said, and we have many of his writings. He said, pray continually for the rest of mankind as well, that they may find God. For for there is in them hope for repentance. Therefore, allow them to be instructed by you, at least by your deeds. At minimum, people should be instructed, should be guided to God by us, by our actions by our deeds, by us actually living, becoming more holy, believing in Christ, and then to everyone in our lives, whoa, they're becoming such better people, honest people, loving people, right after they, you know, begin going to church, right after they, you know, become a Christian, they just immediately started becoming such a better person because the love, the holiness is exuding from us. Now, some are evil. They hate the light. They hate holiness. And, and all, all those who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. But others, many, they're seeking for the moral path. They're seeking for, for to become a better person, especially those who are spiritually seeking. And, and including me, I was seeking, what is ideal morality? And you found it. It's Christ. Now the process is become more like him. Enter into the fullness. Know him more deeply. Become as much like him as you can before you pass on into glory for eternity.